Okay, so I'm Ayan Ghatok and I'm working as a software engineer at Fusion Charts currently, all right. So at Fusion Charts, we have been building charts, gauges and maps which we, we, we will be licensing, which we license to our 26,000 customers and around say around 700,000 developers worldwide. Many of you over here might know about Fusion Charts as a flash based charting company, right. But about six years ago, we have completely transitioned to JavaScript based charting and since then we have been making charts in JavaScript and HTML5 only. So last year what happened, we got a, a customer requirement to deal with large amount of data. Now, dealing with large amount of data uh, is a pretty general use case as of now, right? Uh, because we all often have to deal with large amount of data at one point or the other. So the question is, can we visualize this amount of data on our browsers? Can we explore them can, uh, or just can we make some sense out of this large amount of data on our browsers? So, well, yes, the answer is yes, but the options are pretty restricted. Why? Because the rendering capabilities of the browsers are quite limited when we are talking about in context of this large amount of data. So, how to tackle these limitations? We can have two approaches. One, we can handle the data. Second, we can handle the browsers. So, uh, first I will be speaking on how can you uh, handle the data? So uh, th th this is a perspective one we will be speaking. So as we know, browsers are not quite comfortable to handle a large volume of data. Is it fine? Okay, sorry for the interruption. So browsers are not quite comfortable to handle large amount of data. So can we just think about like, can we scale down the entire data? So what happens if we can somehow scale down the entire large data, uh, we will be reducing the number of elements and say, uh, specifically speaking, we will be reducing the number of visual elements if we try to plot them out. So if the requirement around the data permits us, then we can actually go for data crunching. So here we will be uh, just giving a brief uh, introduction of uh, what are some of the common data crunching techniques. So I'll give just an overview of them and discuss uh, them right now in detail over here. So let's first go with data aggregation. All of us, uh, many of us are aware of what is data aggregation, right? So in this da data aggregation, we can do not uh, change the, uh, we actually visualize or treat the entire data at a go uh, and the information is not changed. Only what is changed is the level of depth on which we are viewing, uh, viewing the data. Say for example, you, we are trying to uh, month uh, daily sales of a e-commerce website. So instead of daily sales, we see the monthly sales or we go on a step further. So in data aggregation, what we are changing the depth of the details for uh, viewing it. So it, this is one of the way we can reduce the data. Second is like filtering. We apply different kinds of filters and uh, conditions which will actually reduce the entire large data to smaller subsets. So uh, this is one way we can reduce our data. Sampling is but picking up a small data set from a large population and re getting it repre representative of the entire population. So this also helps and you know like uh, data analysts and the statisticians love this sampling part and they have been using for long. So all these kinds of optimizations are actually work if the requirement around your data, what's happening? If the requirement around the data perm uh, permits us, what does, when, what does happen when it actually doesn't permit? Let us analyze that part. So uh, we had large data, right? If we, if we are talking here about large data, we see a couple of patterns there. So what I've, uh, I'll just uh, mention two of the patterns, which is the most, most common uh, ones. Uh, this is working. Oh yeah. So uh, th these are the two common patterns right, which we speak when you are speaking in the context of large data, we see lots of clusters. So if you actually plot or visualize large data, we see clusters, you see gapping and there is uh, also distributions like some data will be tightly distributed, some data will be loosely distributed. We see a lot of patterns when the, pat uh, when the patterns get repeated, we see trends and there is also an exceptions part which uh, either there is an exception in the patterns or there is an exception which we call as the outliers in the data. So this was about the importance of large data. But uh, what we are missing uh, is some of the meanings, even if you are speaking about large data, we also miss some of the meanings uh, if you actually crunch the data. Let us say if you have a, what, what 
benefit if we give if you are treating the high volume. If data is actually large, the chances are pretty high that you are answering much more specific questions. You can ask your data a lot of questions and you get, uh, there's a high probability that you get a lot of specific answers. And you have the freedom to go atomic. So from any level, you can drill down to any uh, minute details. So that, that's how we can go atomic to any level if we actually have uh, the entire large data and uh, that, that is the thing. So here we will be uh, revisiting all of this uh, in the uh, live visualizations which will be coming uh, later. But let us speak about the other side of the coin. Let us speak of the other perspective that is this was the how we handle the data. Let us see how can we handle the browsers. Okay, or what if the browsers can render all of the data, uh, high volume of data, right? So, uh, not only that, uh, even if it can handle at what extent it can actually handle that. So uh, we will be seeing a live demo uh, for uh, for this. So here we have our data of the weights and uh, the prices of a large set of diamonds, and we want to see how the price of the diamonds is actually varying with its weight. So let's uh, check out this. Uh, uh, live version. All right. So, is it visible? Okay. So, you see, uh, the this is quite faded, right? All right. So we see, uh, vi visibly, we see uh, the, the, this. This is how uh, about approximately there's a million data point over here. It's down with opacity, so we can't actually judge much. But see. There, there, there is some amounts of plot over there, all right. So this is how a million data, if we actually render on the browsers, looks like, right? So uh, before I dive into the technical details, like uh, how we can actually render this kind of data, uh, high volume data on our browsers, let us see uh, if the problems, we, whatever we were speaking previously, is actually getting solved, uh, all right? So. We will be uh, exploring this entire visualization, previously demonstrated visualization, using one uh, one of the common uh, data exploration mantra, that is uh, Snydersman mantra. So what he says is like, first you give an overview of the entire visualization, allow the user to zoom and filter, and then you ask the details on demand. So let's see how this visualization helps, uh, how it helps us, right? So first you see uh, th there is a lot of patterns over here. So you see uh, there are some spikes and this is the over, over, overall pattern. Uh, so if you actually see uh, there's a lot of clustering in comparison to this part of the screen, it's so much clustered and uh, clustered over here. So all we need to do is just, you know, zoom a portion of it and you will get a visual that this is, uh, this is the clustered uh, visual what was coming before. On, uh, on a uh, detailed look, you see there, there, there is a uh, white, distinct line over there or a portion of there. This has got a special kind of meaning. This is a gap pattern which we are speaking about. So there is a discrete gap inside the visualization. It can have some different uh, interpretations, but uh, th this is how we it helped us in analyzing the clusters and gaps which we are referring. What about the distributions? See, some parts are very tightly distributed and we'll, if you go over there, there are some uh, very loose distributions, right? So we also have uh, distributions. We can see different types of distributions over here. We get a lot of trends. So th th see, this is one of the trends. And at some part of the, see, the trends actually broke. The width of this is actually smaller than that. So, you know, the often we, uh, also there is uh, some exceptions on the patterns, right? Apart from that, we also have some outliers, which is so much far and only we, you can realize these outliers only when you zoom uh, zoom, uh, zoom the stuff. So wh when you see outlier, the natural inclination is, what is that point? Why, why has it been plotted so far? What is so special meaning about it? And this kind of uh, details on demand, attaching a tool tip or any such activities help us. Let us see how filtering, he, uh, the Snydersman mantra, we had been referring about filtering. So how, how does actually filtering helps us? Uh, So uh, if you see that gap what we were speaking, so this is a discrete kind of gap. Now this is not a quite uniform behavior. If you actually filter the different data uh, data sets, so these are actually different data sets. You see for some data sets, th this is not discretized. So 
filtering also gives us some inference some hint which were not very obvious in the initial phase so so, so to summarize this uh, snydersman mantra uh, is that what we got is like we got a glimpse how actually uh, visualizing the entire large data is actually giving some more insights more inference out of it so do you think like uh, this all uh, rendering in a, a, even as a large as a million data point was a straightforward rendering right definitely not and uh, and if you if you an svg is never an option for this because like for every plot every circles if you are thinking that, if you are thinking that uh, we will be having a dom element now that's not an uh, easy options and that that, that don't happen because it will be too much hazardous for the browsers and we we switch to canvas rendering so uh, uh, we thought about okay let's try with canvas and try to render the uh, as large data as a million data point so what was our experience about uh, when we tried with canvas right so canvas was pretty uh, fast uh, when we tried rendering around uh, 1000 2000 5000 10000 even uh, 30 40000 something really peculiar happened when we tried rendering around uh, 50000 data and uh, what happened is we didn't get any script error we didn't get any any kind of error what we got is like a blank visual so it was pretty strange for me like wh what's happening so if you uh, if you have to understand that then it's just a simple like we all had been working with canvas so how does canvas works we need to understand that so we give set of instructions to canvas say uh, move to this point draw a circle move to that point draw a circle like this set of instructions we give on uh, keep on giving the canvas and at the end uh, all while this process the canvas starts remembering or memorizing it saving uh, in technical terms like saving it in its context all right so what happens when we actually give this sequential informations for around 50,000 data, the canvas loses its context and it fails to render or visualize anything. So we actually land up getting a, a uh, so we actually land up getting a blank screen. So that's how overtasking of canvas led us to the context. So we already saw that we could have rendered 50 more than 50,000 data, but then what? How did we stretch the limit? So. This, this this is how we actually uh, uh, thought about like let's do it like this it's nothing but a batch processing so you have an entire data you divide the entire data into smaller number of chunks and then you visualize it say we i have to render around say a uh, 10 uh, 10 circles so instead of giving all the 10 commands i give it in a set of two and every time i give the command i ask the browser to render itself now this is uh, so what happening is like uh, there is a progressive rendering hovering uh, occurring over here so you see the this actually uh, progressive rendering gives us two advantages right the browser didn't have a blank visual as we were talking previously and second time the first visual was coming in the least possible time now that was pretty important because when you have a large data you take some time uh, no matter what you take some time to render for so you cannot keep your end user to wait until the entire rendering is actually complete so what do you do you give him something to see and when he is uh, seeing uh, that you, if on the next couple of iterations we render the entire part of it right so having said that like uh, you know this might be entirely not scientific to represent a smaller chunk of data instead of the larger one but uh, as it's a large data even that smaller chunk has some patterns or some uh, properties resembling that of the original one or the uh, large data one so was this all about rendering so it, this this was the only optimization that was required for rendering part so was it all about rendering i guess not we had been speaking about clusters we and uh, when i tried to just render it it was giving us so much faded view i can't even uh, see anything so uh, we needed something which will help us to analyze it better what was it like we needed the feature of zooming right so how can we actually uh, technically have this uh, zooming feature in in uh, inscribed right so how can we have it see like uh, this was a uh, this was a clusters we were speaking and we were not getting enough details out of it so what we did is we zoomed in this part and we get something very interesting out of this this cl clusters and gaps out of it so technically speaking uh, th this was pretty easy right because uh, uh, zooming means only you have to do is to multiply the every coordinates of your plots with some scale factors so that it grows big so if you say if you have a uh, uh, thumb, uh, say 100 into 100 pixel area so when you zoomed uh, 10 pixel into 10 pixel 
window out of it, all you need to do is to multiply the entire coordinates with 10 times. So actually, it grows 10 times bigger. So that's all about zooming. It was uh, uh, pretty easy. What about panning? And wh why do we need to pan actually? So when you say you actually zoomed in a small region and you find something interesting out of this. Now we look whether this kind of pattern, whether this kind of uh, gaps or anything like that occurred in some adjacent place. So our natural inclination is after zooming, we uh, seek for panning across. So how can we actually pan the data or scroll the data? All right. So this uh, this uh, it represents the currently visible window, and after zooming, th this is the effective canvas area, the zoomed canvas area, whatever speaking. So there was kind of two approaches for panning. One, we could translate the pre-rendered canvas, what was the previous one we were speaking. So you zoom 10 times, I uh, redraw the entire canvas in a 10 times scaled version and all I need to do with every mouse move on panning to translate the entire canvas. That is the most smoothest operation we can have while this panning interaction. But this has got a severe drawback. What is that? Say you have a large data and you want to drill down to a specific plot. So it's like zooming hundred and thousand times, something like this. So if we actually try to make our effective canvas area thousand times the size of our device screen uh, height or width, that was a pretty impossible thing and the browser failed to do so. So this approach of increasing the um, uh, total effective area was not going to work if we actually plan to uh, Rend, uh, render uh, uh, if you actually plan to pan uh, in this manner. So what was the next option? Can we render the entire plot on demand? Uh, so say if you uh, so you zoomed only a portion and that part of the um, portion of the canvas gets rendered. So that was pretty good for zooming. But when we actually tried this for panning, what happened for every mouse move, the coordinates gets replaced and for every mouse move, we have to actually re-render the plots. Now that was really expensive and it was a pretty bad UI. Uh, so because uh, that was not happening. So what we thought is let's move to the uh, solution. Like we can apply this nine grid algorithm over here. So what is uh, this nine grid algorithm is pretty interesting. So we never draw the full canvas. What we do, this is a visible area. We first draw this grid and next what we do, we draw the eight adjacent grids next to it, each, by, uh, each one in, in the background. So the user never sees these nine grids at a time. User concentrates only the, at the center grid and at the, while he is busy in seeing this center grid, the rest eight adjacent grids actually uh, is already been rendered or pre-rendered. So when the user actually starts panning, uh, say to the right side, what happens is uh, the, uh, the, this uh, center of uh, the visible grid changes to this and only this three increase, uh, sorry about this. Only this three incremental grids need, needs to be rendered. So th this was actually working pretty fine. So if I have to explain this over here, so what happens is like uh, if you have to, uh, so when I'm at maximum, user can start from this leftmost point to and scroll up to the rightmost point, right? So at maximum, you have to render at least one grid out over here, right? So if we do that, then only it solves the purpose. So that's why we chose for this nine grid and we don't need more, more than nine because at maximum user cannot shift more than one grid at a time. So th this was the incremental, uh, incremental rendering that actually helps us uh, the problem of uh, mouse lag, of zooming even in the nth level. So that, that's pretty cool, right? Now, so uh, let's recollect the Snydersman mantra once again. Uh, so uh, what, what we had previously was like uh, we first gave you the overview of the plot, overview of the visualizations. Then we actually zoomed and filtered and showed that there are some uh, there are some interesting patterns out here. And now the next thing, once we actually zoom and filter, things becomes interesting for us because these plots were so small in the initial view, we didn't even think of having any details out of it. When we actually zoomed and uh, panned it, we found that this is an outlier. What, what is there? So we uh, get interested out of it. We try to fetch some details out of it. So how can we do that? Right. So uh, what, what is, uh, because tool, displaying a tooltip is not a big deal, but how can we do that in Canvas? Because as I already said, we had been using Canvas. So how can I actually have a tooltip over Canvas? Or how can you have 
interactions over a canvas. So, uh, because uh, in canvas we actually doesn't keep track of the points what we draw. Like in SV SVG, what happened? We had a specific. Uh, we know where the plots are drawn, and we can attach the browser events to that and display the tooltip. So we will be using a, a cool approach over here. So this is how simulating browser events algorithmically. This will help you to add interactions even on a canvas element. So what you do is like uh, you render a transparent circle over here, transparent SVG circle over here, and on every mouse move, we track algorithmically that whether there is any point underlying that hovered point. So uh, if we can track at every mouse move accurate enough and fast enough, there what happens on tracking? This transparent circle, which was drawn in the left corner of the screen, immediately transforms back to that point. And now, when it actually comes under your cursor, now as this is, is transparent, the user was uh, user do not get aware of this. And now you can actually attach any any click event, any mouse over event, any kinds of interactions right on this. So it's like you know hacking the interactions uh, events on a flat canvas element. So. Uh, this was a cool approach. This, this was fine, but how to track so fast, so accurate? How, how can we actually track our mouse with every mouse move? We need to search uh, from a million data point that whether there is a point underlying that point being hovered. So for that approach, we uh, we chose to uh, we chose to implement this KD tree implementation. So this, this is the nearest uh, uh, implementation for uh, algorithm for finding the nearest neighborhood. So what, what is KD tree? It's like a space uh, partitioning data structure where we actually div uh, divide the entire uh, portion into k-dimensional space. Here we will be speaking only about the two dimension because that's the point of interest over here. We are interested about x and y. This would be our dimensions. So primarily we will be uh, showing uh, that uh, how to build a KD tree and how can you search effectively using a uh, KD tree, right? So uh, th these are the sample points which will be uh, I'll be using. Uh, to illustrate how to build a KD tree and also how to search uh, KD tree in a pretty fast manner. So the algorithm steps for the algorithm is pick a random dimension that can be x, that can be y, pick any dimension, find the median point along that, all right. Sec uh, find the median point, split or partition the data into two halves, and then keep on recursively doing that uh, or with the alternate dimension. Let's see what we are speaking. So first we are taking the dimension y. Okay, this is the y direction. It keeps growing, uh, increasing in the upward direction, and x increases in this direction. It's a normal coordinate axis uh, convention. So what happens when we uh, find the median across the uh, with the y coordinates for this set of points? One seems to be the median, uh, median most point, and one comes in the center of the center of the tree, and the entire space gets divided into two uh, two partitions. On the next step, for the next uh, set of tree, uh, the logic uh, or the convention is. Whichever coordinate is less goes on the left leg, and the, uh, whichever is on the uh, greater goes on the right leg. So th this part of the sorry, uh, so, uh, so th this part of the this part of the tree goes on the right, and this uh, downward part goes on the left. So similarly, but this time we had to find the median across the x direction because previously we had chose uh, we had find the median across the y direction. So similarly, if we recursively iterate the process, we are nothing but partitioning the entire data into alternate grades, right? Each time we are choosing uh, the alternate dimension and finding the median point, dividing into two partitions. So th this is the corresponding tree. Uh, K uh, sorry. So this is the corresponding KD tree that we've actually formed with this sample number of data. So how can we? F uh, so KD tree is already built, right? So how can I actually find find what is my nearest neighbor point, right? Say, th th this is my this is the query point, right? In the green over here. So I, I actually have to find which is the nearest point, right? So all what I did is in first comparison, I compare whether the y coordinate for this query point lies to the uh, lies uh, is a y coordinate for this query point is less than that of one or greater than one or that of one. If as we see the y coordinate for this is less than, so if we actually for just one comparison, we actually discard discard this entire part of the tree. Similarly, on the next iterations, we find all right. So we need to find whether the x coordinate for this query point is less than that of the two or right uh, or greater than that of the two. So in this way, we dis uh, we find that it is greater than. So we discard the le left left part of the tree. 
and on the next we find that okay th th this is close to 9 in comparison to uh, what is that point 3 I guess uh, so uh, uh, 5 yeah so it's uh, closer to 9 so just you see if, if you sorry so if you if you actually see that uh, by making just four comparisons you can uh, we can actually find which is the nearest uh, nearest point we were, we were speaking so that's the beauty of kd tree now this four has some special meaning this tree we had been showing with 10 uh, elements but this tree has four depths which can accommodate around 16 elements so even we, if we had a 16 number of elements just by doing four comparisons we can actually find uh, which is the nearest point so if you if you uh, uh, calculate for even a million points so even if we have a million points just by making four uh, just by making 20 comparisons right then uh, we can find the uh, nearest neighborhood point so th this was working pretty fine and it was for, uh, ma making things pretty good but what was happening is uh, the building time for uh, kd tree implementation was pretty high why uh, because for every dimensions every dimensions when we are showing how we will be building the tree we were showing that uh, we have to find the median now we we used to find the median using the sorting uh, first we used to sort and then we used to find the median point now ex every time for every depth formation if we actually have to sort now as sorting was the most heaviest operation over here it was taking time so we uh, decided to do a little tweak to this kd tree which we named internally as modified kd tree so let, let us see how this right so this is nothing but uh, so in this type of structure what uh, uh, what we uh, previously every point had two legs right here we have actually seven legs right so we have four tree structure the smaller nodes represents trees and this middle uh, larger ones represents the uh, pivot points so every level has uh, seven elements four trees and three pivot points now how to divide them again division remains the same find them uh, instead of median you sort the array and then you find what are the four points which will actually divide the entire space into four partitions see so on the first level of building the tree we divide the entire space into four partitions and in the next level similarly with alternate axis we div uh, divided into another uh, four structures but as we didn't have so many amount of elements over here so you can see in level of, uh, next level of tree there is only two elements but I, as I said every node should have seven elements so I'm not I haven't actually drawn all the legs over here because that would be so much clumsy now that was the building the tree part so if, if we recollect what was the tree structure for this same num elements uh, previously for KD tree, how is it actually different from this modified KD tree? The first observations will tell us that you know it has only two depths, whereas the previously KD tree had four uh, four depths. So here the depth of the tree has increased, and as I said, sorting was the main uh, thing that was uh, taking uh, that was the main time-consuming stuff. So as we here we have decreased the uh, depth of the tree, we had an advantage of uh, this tree building time. Right. So let's see how uh, search uh, how we can search this. So that was the building part and modified tree. Actually, you can build in a much faster way than that of KD tree. What about searching part? So same example. Uh, uh, this is the query point, and I'm interested to find which is the nearest neighbor. So on the first comparison, I have to find I, I have to find that whether this point so we we take each pivot point and we find whether the coordinate is less than that of that pivot point or greater than. So if it is so in this case. For even just by making one comparison that this point is actually less than that of your first pivot point actually discarded this entire entire tree so just by making one comparisons we discarded the entire eight elements and this is this is the remaining uh, two elements which on the next iterations we can uh, we could have just uh, got so even by making just two comparisons we can have uh, have a point that we uh, the neighbor point that we were looking for right okay so uh, so th th this helps right but there is a catch previously in kd tree there was only two legs here luckily we had that by making one comparison this was falling in this tree and we were not we were not comparing any other trees 
but if the point is lying on the left rightmost of rightmost tree so if the point of our interest lies in this tree so we needed to make four comparisons okay now that's the heaviest thing while searching kd tree each level we had to search only once here we need to make four search uh, in the worst case so what uh, so in a nutshell modified kd tree although helped us in building the kd, uh, building the tree in the minimum possible time rather um, uh, better than that of the kd tree but modified kd tree takes a longer time to search you know in the worst case scenario so we had to take a trade off so uh, it might be uh, seeming that you know if we increase the breadth of the tree we uh, if we keep on increasing the breadth of the tree it will happen but we needed to take a trade off between building time and searching time okay so th these are some of the references i have been uh, using in this uh, presentation you can uh, learn about the visualization techniques in the now you see it book written by stephen few the data which has been used is uh, available over this link we have provided a fidel version of this uh, uh, of the prototype which we were explaining and in my uh, github profile we uh, i have updated some of the minimum codes the major roadblocks whatever we were speaking whatever the major challenges we get them so all you need to do is go over there and just try it out it doesn't have the exact finish of the fusion charts uh, zoom scattered chart uh, but it definitely uh, will help you understand what are the major roadblocks and how we can optimize them so that's it from me i'll be looking for some feedbacks and questions also thank you any questions uh, uh, hi uh, hello yeah. whatever now uh, the whole process of this rendering and then uh, decision tree or i mean whatever that uh, tree uh, identification neighborhood you have done uh, can you tell what was the volume of data you tested and how much time it took to render or to do all this process and render in a browser okay so if if you try for a mil million data points mm -hmm. uh, it it would have been taking around uh, three uh, two uh, the first visual will come around 1.5 seconds uh, almost all right and in the background it keeps on uh, rendering the rest part of it all right so the user actually we can engage the user with the first uh, visual around 1 uh, 1 or 1.5 seconds okay right. now um, uh, instead of svg the canvas concept will uh, i mean uh, will be more performance what you are selling right so when we go for the zooming is that like i mean the pixel uh, when we zoom the clarity will go right for compared to SVG concept on canvas. So, how does that actually? When uh, are you limiting the zooming as well? Like he has to go to till that point, or how it is like? I didn't get you. See, uh, if you are zooming, then. Ha. Huh. So now, when you use the canvas thing, when you apply zoom on that, as and when getting zoom, the clarity will go of that object. It's it's not that much clear when no, you we use are, the we are, No, 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 no. Uh, it's not pixelated view, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It's not an image view. Uh, we are actually re-rendering the plot, so it's the same canvas element. On zooming it, so uh, let, let me illustrate. So it, it, it say you, you actually try to zoom this part. So what you are doing? So this is in the zoom mode. So it, when when you are doing this, you are, you, you are actually re-rendering the entire screen. It's not the pixelated ones, right? Uh, so it's it's down because of the opacity. What you uh, it might appear. But it's not—it's not the pixel uh, pixelation what we are doing. So that—that's not the thing. We are again re-rendering, which will keep the image intact. So at that point only, you are applying the tool tips. Which point? See, uh, now uh, when, when the page loads in the starting, so there are a lot of million of data points, right? So yeah. that <coughs> mouse over when you try at that point of time. Yeah. Um, maybe because there are a lot of million points, it might not. Uh, I mean, we don't know which point we are doing. Right. So you are applying the logic that algorithm what you explained in it, the it is it, it is from the first level only there first is nothing level yeah it, it is actually from the first level so the uh, flow is something like this first we render the entire part of the data mm -hmm. then in the background when the user is actually seeing the entire data the overview the first part the overview of the data the user is seeing the data that time in the background we uh, we develop the tree so for that few milliseconds time when the we were actually building the tree that time if the user actually interacts we, he might not get the 
tool tip because that time we are building the tree but within next few milliseconds once the tree building is complete from that point of time throughout uh, no matter how much he interacts the tool tip algorithm just works all right okay no problem yeah hello uh, well uh, it can be anything all right so uh, using the standard fusion charts model uh, i have tested around uh, it worked pretty good for 3 million uh, data points uh, but there are some other optimizations which we have to there are some other features which we have to uh, ship across the product um, so we cannot optimize the entire part of it in fusion charts model but if you sacrifice some of these features uh, then it this entire logic is capable to render around i have tested it for 8 million data okay so 8 million data i couldn't uh, create more than 9 million uh, in dynam dynamically so it 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 is pretty good to even render around 8 million data and you can actually drill down to a single data from this 8 million have a tool tip that's the beauty of this entire part you know and yeah. it's so uh, good to actually uh, visualize the large data that's it hello hello yeah my question was about uh, whether all the charts are drawn in here yeah yeah whether uh, all the charts are drawn in canvas or only few charts are drawn in canvas where this kind of performance issues are there all right uh, so th there's something interesting things happening see with every legend click i'm just uh, uh, toggling the visibility right so here uh, we have uh, thought about having each canvas for each data set so that this becomes easy so on every data click you just toggle the visibility of that canvas apart from that like uh, this uh, gre uh, this grid whatever you are saying you can have uh, nine grids nine canvas for that nine grids that's pretty fine or you can all do in a single move also okay yeah my question is about uh, let's say if there is a pie chart right so if there is a five pie chart there is a pie chart there is a bar chart there is a line chart okay so does the same rule of using canvas for those charts apply or is it based on the data points you no, no, it's account. nothing to do with uh, call, uh, specific charts you can apply this is a generic logic you can apply uh, this in any any types of chart or any uh, types of uh, re rendering so okay. even if uh, okay so the benchmark uh, as you said uh, 40000 uh, data points is uh, for all types of charts right yeah it it, it is actually uh, see canvas uh, is like more of like painting an image so the more you paint in a canvas the greater time it takes okay right so it's something like this it's nothing to do with a specific chart type or specific type of visualization yeah 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 hi so for this visualization uh, do you use d3 or any of the uh, no uh, this is uh, we had been uh, using this with fusion chart zoom scatter model all right so uh, zoom scatter we have built this chart um, the scatter chart it's nothing but a xy chart capable of handling even a million data points so that's it all right so d3 is a open source library it's a great library actually so we can also do you can also try out uh, same things in d3 all right but the problem is uh, here uh, in d3 it's more like a fundamental all right it's more like a drawing library here you get the back up product directly so we, uh, uh, as we have a li uh, we are licensed product we cannot actually disclose uh, the entire source code but um, using fusion charts like uh, we, you get the beta product so when you can concentrate on other things and you get easily done but everything what i said is pretty generic and it has n nothing to do that you can't use it with this and that you can definitely try out d3 for this but again if it will lack the final polish and you have to lot of do these things so that's what we are doing on our part All right. hello uh, yeah my question was about uh, how do you test these charts because you guys uh, where, uh, here i am pradeep yeah hi yeah. so you guys actually sell these charts right so you have to be make sure that uh, uh, when you do changes in the code also the chart works perfectly so do you do testing you, i mean uh, the testing of the charts i can't fo follow uh, we it's so, a licensed product yeah say for example uh, you released a uh, 5.0 i mean next version of your product uh, where the charts are some improvements are there Okay. so how do you test these charts how do you test these charts yeah whether they are okay, working we, we have we have our automation systems running so what testing you are speaking about the feature testing 
yeah all yeah. the features so we have we have a auto automated uh, automated testing that ru runs on our server so every day whatever uh, code we commit and everything that gets tested and the next day uh, the qa team gets a report that okay fine these features have been broken or this has been improved and even for the memory part like whether uh, the time taken to render because this is a highly performance intensive chart we actually keep track of the things that whether we have degraded on the performance or not uh, in order to you know give some extra features so th that so in that testing frameworks you use uh, so it's like uh, we have our internal uh, testing framework uh, we uh, we uh, use it to for image comparison mainly all right so we compare that both images in the two releases and that's how we, uh, do you recommend any open source available sorry do you recommend any open source similar libraries available for testing uh you, you can uh, try uh, try out anything like karma or Q, you, you can try out like unit testing any frameworks right or even mocha works good Okay, thank you. Please meet the speaker outside. We're really run, running out of time. Okay, thank okay. you.